Air Lindhurst was opened by Sir George Martin in 1992 in an incredible converted church. And Lindhurst Hall remains one of the most spectacular classical recording spaces on earth. We spoke to members of the Air team about life at Air, the history of the studio and more. So I'm Jeff Foster, uh, Chief Engineer here at Air. Uh, started in 1987 and was fortunate enough to work at the old Oxford Circus um, studio and then was involved in the design of this place uh, which when George Martin found the building and said right we've got somewhere to move air to because the lease was up um, in Oxford Circus and uh, so yes, I was uh, fortunate enough to be to, to work there and to then come here, be, be, be tortured by the process of building a studio from scratch, and then um, have worked here for, well, worked with Air now for over 30 years. Oxford Circus was very much a pop studio, and George, being the visionary that he was, um, saw that the pop world was no longer going to have large amounts of money in it and that for the studio to continue to exist we needed to um, engage with the sort of film world and we a little bit of film work came to Oxford Circus but not very much um, and so we this place was built with a view to being a pop studio where you could definitely do film and the large hall comfortably holds 60 or 70 piece orchestra and with some clever choice of what's playing and what have you, you know, I've, I've had a hundred strings in there. So it, it's, it's possible to, to do very big, very, you know, bombastic material, which is very film friendly as a recording space. Um, but the air itself was originally set up um, by producers who were working for EMI, who wanted to make records not under the umbrella of the EMI, this is how you do it. So they built a studio. The old air was a studio built for artists by artists. Air started as a break-off facility to bring all of the facilities of the large studios that were attached to record labels or you know film companies and to make an independent facility that had all of the, all of the advantages of working that without any of the constraints of being part of a large organisation, which we still are. So we're still proudly independent and very much do our own thing, um, which is, is very much part of Air's history and makes us unique. It was the first independent recording studio, which was what AIR actually stands for, Associated Independent Recording. And they, over the years, expanded it and, and, and had a very firm idea of how to make an artist feel at home and how to have a creative space in which you just want to perform. And the secret of making a great record or a great piece of music is that the musicians have to perform. You know, it doesn't matter what gear you have, if they aren't comfortable performing, you're not going to record a great performance. And George understood that and he brought with his years of experience the idea that the place should feel very open and spacious. So you'll see here in Studio One, you know, we've got daylight, we've got big windows, the control rooms have space. And, you know, it was creating an environment in which musicians wanted to perform. And I remember Johnny Marr, Oddly, I worked with him over the years a few times, and he was uh, came to the old air in Oxford Circus and stepped into Studio One there, which is the same sort of size as this. And I remember he picked up his guitar and he played something. He said, oh my God, this is so amazing. I just want to play it again to hear the instrument in this room. And then about 10 years later, we were working together and he was in the hall, the bigger hall, uh, and he did the same thing. He says, I can't believe it. I'm here again and it's another room that does this. And so... That's the lesson that was learnt, you know, that's the, 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 the gift, if you like, was a space in which musicians feel they want to perform, they feel comfortable to perform. Our main facility is um, the hall, which is a huge studio which can seat up to 100 musicians, which we use on a daily basis to record large orchestras for film music. And then Studio One is a smaller room, which also gets a lot of use for strings and orchestral things, but was set up as a 
a pop recording studio to record rock bands, which we still do um, when we can. We also have two large mix rooms, which are both set up for Dolby Atmos mixing. Um, they're set up in an identical fashion so that we can move projects between the two rooms. One still has a SSL G series in amazing condition if people do want to do analog mixing, but then here in Studio 3, this is more set up as a digital, digital mix room. So we have the luxury of a huge tracking space which allows us to put the microphones a lot further away from the instruments than one normally would in a smaller studio, which allows the sound to develop and be more natural. And then we can also capture the natural reverberation of the room, which in the hall is spectacular. The process of recording is an iterative one. And uh, one of the things, again, that's been great about the Air Studios um, process is that there's an apprenticeship and it's a long apprenticeship usually as, an, as a sort of runner through to an assistant, through to an assistant engineer who actually get, does sort of the old bits of housework to becoming a you know, freelance engineer that's come through the air, air system. Um, and what that process means is that you're able to learn what works and what doesn't work. So we have many different engineers come through the door. They put up mics in a certain way. They'll Smart ones always say, how do people do it? What's the, you know, What's the norm? So if, if they're not sure. Um, and so there is the sort of, there is no one person invented recording as such. Uh, there are along the way, you know, the, the Decca tree, which wasn't actually invented by Decca, but the Decca tree became the way to record orchestras in certain rooms in certain situations. Um, I know I stole a load of what I do from uh, one of George Martin's uh, engineers, uh, John Jacobs, and uh, he stole some of it from Jeff Emeritt, who did actually invent a lot of what's going on because the Beatles were the first at it. But the process is one of, that works, I'll steal that, that works, I'll steal that, and so you put together something that creates your sound. So as, a, as an institution, if you like, I think the fact that air is here and has been here for so long, it propagates a level of education that you just can't get in a course. You know, there's a thousand and one courses out there of, 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 you know, learn to be an engineer, learn to be a producer. And the bit that is always missed in these courses is you just have to sit in the room. You have to learn to read a room. You have to understand, as I was saying earlier on, you have to understand that to make a record, you gotta have musicians who are able to perform. The gear is neither here nor there. Where you put the mic is irrelevant if they can't perform. And so there is this sort of process of learning that comes with experience. Um, and, you know, apprenticeships are sort of outdated beyond a way to make people work for less money these days. But actually, we still have this tradition of people spending time understanding without it being them making a mistake how you get stuff together so that by the time an engineer gets his first gig um, they know what they're doing and they've watched the greats do it. We're setting up the Decca tree at the moment for an orchestral uh, kind of string recording um, and we'll usually set these up kind of every time we do a string recording or a, a recording of um, any orchestral means in here and uh, it just means that we get an overall pickup uh, that's really clear and concise and gives us a good image of the room and stuff. I'm Ash, I'm an assistant here at Air Studios. I've been here for uh, about five and a half years now. Um, sort of a lot of my duties tend towards the more recordist side of work these days, the sort of process operation as well as the sort of more runner side of studio setup and the more technical sort of control room aspect of getting sound in and out of the computer, basically. Today we've got 20, um, so that's including all the room mics. We've got a tree, a pair in the middle here, and a sort of more ambient room pair at the back of the room. Uh, and then spots-wise, we've got two, per, two or three per section here, but we can go in really clinically and have one per sort of music stand per section. So that's one mic per two players. 
um, which is typically what we'll do in the hall next door, but um, in here, because it's with smaller sections, we sometimes get a more broader pickup um, because the room's a bit drier as well. You don't need to be quite so clinical with the, with the miking. We've got a, um, a 72 channel desk in there, but because it's not in line, we're sort of quite restricted on the number of mics that we can get in and out in there for monitoring purposes. So while we've got, I think, 50 preamps in the walls here, we won't tend to use more than sort of 30 to 40 mics on, a, on any given session because it gets a little bit tricky in terms of actually getting them in to record. I'm Rebecca. Um, I did my placement year here from uni. Um, went to finish the rest of my degree and then they very kindly took me back afterwards. Um, so I've been here full time for two years um, as a assistant engineer. I guess it's, a, it's quite a personal thing in terms of the way we work all together as a team. Um, I think we're very lucky to work in a place that has the advantage of working on some really quite big projects um, and meeting lots of people and different ways of working, but also um, only having two live areas. We also have quite a small team, so there's about eight assistants. Um, and so you get to know everyone very well, and obviously you spend a lot of time with them. Um, and so it's, it's really cringy, but it's very like, it's sort of family orientated. We all know how each other works. Um, we all know how to help each other out. Um, and I think that comes across when we're recording, we're working with clients and um, a sort of more relaxed aura for something that could otherwise be quite intimidating <laughs> with all the musicians sitting in front of you. Um, yeah, I think, at least for me, that makes a big, a big difference. Uh, my name is Rupert Coulson. I started at AIR in 1987 in July, uh, when the studio was at Oxford Street. Um, I was taken on as an assistant engineer, started working there, you know, working on sessions, mix sessions, recording sessions at Oxford Street. Um, when the studio moved to where we are now in Hampstead in 92, then we got into a bit more, we did a bit more film music. So I moved into doing more film music. In a classical recording, I suppose the producer is looking out to get the very best performance from the musicians. Um, so reading through a score, making sure that it's sort of technically correct for the repertoire but also listening out for the best takes of the performance uh, as well as having a vision for the sound so it does kind of cross over into engineering usually when I'm doing it I'm doing both jobs so I'm deciding on the microphones and the setup and the sound as well as having an overview on the music musically whether it's been a good take and performance. Doing pop rock music you want to get an immediate, the most immediate sound possible. So the mics are like that close to the snare or that close to the bass drum because you want it to come flying out of the speakers. You want to engage the listener immediately and not let them go. So it's, everything's very immediate and very in your face, whereas film music is completely the opposite because there's invariably a lot of it's under dialogue. So you, you want it to be further away from you nearly all the time. I mean, I mean every now and then it'll be a bit in a movie where it'll be a big section where there's no chit chat. It'll be a kind of montage or something, or there'll just be a, you know, a long shot. So you, then that's the moment where the music can come full front, full front and center. But invariably you're, when you're mixing, when you're recording, you're making sure the music isn't too close. You're kind of pushing, not pushing it away, but you're making sure it's not in your face. You're making sure it's kind of, you know, background score a lot of the time. Most, most, record stuff rock and pop would probably be done in here in, in studio one um although some sort of fantastic albums have been done next door in the hall where which really kind of utilize the space so what it's great for is if you're doing an album um like Joni mitchell's both sides now i don't know if you spoke to jeff foster about that but he recorded that with the band all in the booths around the edge of the hall and Joni singing live with the orchestra playing live in the main space. So it's really incredible for that kind of crossover, if you want to call it, album. Um, but then the, this room's so great for 
bands of of any genre really because it's such a useful space we've we've had big rock bands like Coldplay and Muse and Paul McCartney and pop things like Adele and Katy Perry and then jazz stuff and it's fantastic for big bands and yeah it's a really versatile space one of the ones that springs to mind is working on Mary Poppins Returns in the hall um just because it was something quite different to what I'd experienced before in that um, on the initial recordings we were recording band, orchestra and actors singing for the film all at the same time. Um, so we had the orchestra in the main space and then drums, bass, guitars, rhythm section all in the booths and then the actors in another booth and they were all kind of here singing these songs with musicians for the first time ever. And a lot of them had never really interacted with an orchestra before. Um, and the director, I say made, but asked all of them to go and stand like right in front of the leader of the orchestra and sing their song out into the room live for the first time to kind of get the tempo right. So we're not even recording to click now. This is all just totally live. And kind of watching their reaction and and that interaction between them and the musicians and, and everyone listening in, in all those different spaces listening on headphones, you know, it's and, and the sort of electricity of it being live like that. I just, you know, that's something that you just don't get many other places and it was incredibly exciting and they sounded amazing. One of the things about um, working in film and TV is that there is quite a lot of pressure um, in terms of the money being spent apart from anything else, but also, yeah, there's a lot of people in the room usually, um, directors and producers and a huge orchestra sitting in front of you of 100 people and it's expensive and it's also been a big journey for everyone to get to that recording day you know the composer's been working on it for months and there's been a lot of back and forth with the director and producers and they might have had a lot of sleepless nights the kind of few weeks leading up to it and then they arrive with us <laughs> um, and it's the final hurdle almost and so the sort of first thing anyway for me is to try and make everyone just feel as comfortable and possible and as supported as possible that you know you're here now we've got this we've got you we're going to help you finish this to the best that it can be and I think for me the way I, I guess I don't really think about the money too much because that would be scary but I just I think about the the journey they've been on and the the, the music and you know, just trying to make everyone have a nice day, really. I think that's how I personally get through it is. And then when there are technical, you know, issues, because that happens everywhere, a mic suddenly goes down that you've checked, you know, five times before you started, just because that's how the world works. Um, it's just everyone knowing how to deal with it really efficiently and calmly and quickly. So that's the other thing I think, staying, staying calm, even when things are burning around you is just trying to make sure it's like we've got this everything's fine and you know there have been times five minutes before a session say when a Pro Tools rig's just stopped working for no apparent reason and we've had to swap it out and you're going to the clients yeah we'll we'll play you that thing in just just a second you know <laughs> I look after everything technical I look after the buildings as well but um I'm looking after all aspects of all of the rooms to make sure that um, they've got full functionality all the time is our is our prime prime concern. Um, we've got a technical team of current count, I think five. It might be five and a trainee as well. So we've got quite a high technical staffing level in here. Um, the idea being there's always somebody present on site whenever there's a session in the building. We don't have on-call technicians. Um, the, the needs of the sessions here mean that often somebody has to be able to respond instantly and go keep the sessions running. Day to day, um, there's quite a lot of things we do. We First and foremost, we have to make sure that, as I said before, the sessions are actually operating and operating correctly. And that'll require some uh, early morning or late night setup for the particular requirements. Um, it's the old days, there was lots of aligning of tape machines and uh, dash machines um, with the advent of Pro Tools sweeping all that away. Luckily for us, there's less late nights tweaking all the pots of, uh, of 48 tracks of uh, tape machines with Dolby SR. But um, still, we need to make sure that everything's ready for the session in the morning so that on the downbeat, when the orchestra starts playing, um, everything's working perfectly and it will record from the get-go. Um, the rest of the day, the technicians will be 
looking after the equipment, doing preventative maintenance, repairing microphones, outboard equipment. If we can get into the studios, repairing the consoles, anything that's been logged in the fault books. Um, so any small niggling problems that people are having to work around will be continually uh, checked into. And an- anything else that's sort of cropping up, there's a lot of it now you'd consider to be IT. It's working out why computers aren't working the way that they should be working from the computers that the office staff need, back again through to the Pro Tools rigs and trying to work out what's going on with those when they're not behaving how they ought to be. The consoles at Air, um, we've got a quantity of Neve consoles, I'd say. We're, we're, we're Neve heavy. Um, the, uh, the, our oldest console, the, the custom Neve in Studio One, um, that was built at uh, the end of the 70s, early 80s. Um, three of them were made um, in collaboration with George Martin and, ne- and Rupert Neve to create these consoles. Um, th- the three of them are pretty much unique consoles in the world. We would consider them to be some of the best Neve consoles that were ever created. Um, R1 was the original Oxford Circus console. Um, the other two, one of them was at A&M Studios and I, I forget where it's got to now. One of them was with Brian Adams up in Canada. Um, we think probably the custom Neve sounds the way it does. It is very pure and very simple. Um, it's not Class 8. It has a whole load of op amps in it. Um, very early, any um, 5534As um, with Neve Transformers in it as well, which contributes a lot, I think, to the sound quality. But it's such a good console that when we do technical measurements of it, the total harmonic distortion is like within the error margin of the equipment we're using to measure it with. It's like 0.006% total, total harmonic distortion on some part, on the main parts of the of the channels. So you hear everything. So it's I've heard people in back in the day talk about the colour that it added. The truth is, we don't think it adds any colour at all. It does its magic. And people put, whether it was back in the day with a tape deck or whether it's currently with a Pro Tools session, it's a console that people can put the stuff they've been working on up the desk, faders at zero, and listen to it. And are like, oh, wow, that, it's already amazing. It's, but Because it's not getting in the way of the sound at all. And I, that's, my, that's my opinion on why that particular console is particularly special. I can't claim to have been involved in this console. It was at the old air before I started. Um, <clears throat> and it, Rupert Neve designed it. And it was a, it's kind of, well, I'd say a one-off. It was a three-off. Um, and it is still, without a shadow of doubt, the best sounding console in the world. Um, and it's really inconvenient to use it because modern consoles are in line so you get double the number of channels and much more auxes for headphones and all kinds of stuff and consequently we have a whole lot of stuff around the room to make it behave like a more modern console in terms of more channels and so on and so forth but actually everybody puts up with it because it sounds so good and you know that's what we're here to do. Uh, you know, the inception of that history, the inception of Air, was at a point in the history of London Studios where it was a fairly small community and obviously George Martin and, and the Abbey Road engineers um, were a big part of the, the nucleus of, of that sort of technological development. And uh, so George brought that with him. I mean, for instance, the console in Studio One downstairs was sort of part designed by, I mean, he, he wasn't an, an audio engineering designer, obviously, but, he, you know, he collaborated with Rupert Neve um, on the EQ section, for instance, on the console that's downstairs in Studio One um, to pick out sort of the centre frequencies of the of the parametric sections that he felt were most useful, most musical, whatever word you want to use. And so to that extent, yes, that there is an air thumbprint, really, you know, and it is linked to not only George, obviously, but the technical um, department that still have, you know, connections with the guys that helped set up the original air. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively small community and, and there's a sort of core of pe- people that have run right through that history and uh, some of them are still around, fortunately. So, yeah, there is definitely an air, like I say, sort of identity, really. Other consoles in the studio, we've got the 88R, the Neve 88R, which is actually now in the hall is 20 years old, which um, that has become a, almost a historic console in its own right. Um, we always felt from Neve and from any console manufacturer that the 88R was the first console that actually approached the sonic quality of our custom Neve in Studio One um, with all the extra functionality that you need from a modern console. The main problems with with 
with all with all analog consoles now um, will be the mechanical parts. It's the mechanical parts that'll be difficult to get hold of in the main. So it's the switches, the potentiometers. Um, fortunately, we. Although some manufacturers come and go, like Penny and Giles recently, where they got purchased by, I can't remember who, something like Honeywell. Um, Penny and Giles faders are hard to come by. And we've got particular, it's a GML automation system, so GML faders on our custom need. But there are still people you find out there. There's companies, um, there's a company that's over in the States in New York that um, we're finding we can get bits and pieces from for these old consoles. Um, we're finding that um, we're currently going through a complete re-switch process on the custom Neve, which is all of the um, all of the EQ settings, all, all of the EQ controls rather, uh, on switched atten- a switched resistor type. Atten- it's not switched attenuators, but you know that. So they have to be new ones sourced, um, and but they are being manufactured by the company that made them originally. We then have to go through the process of populating them with all the resistors they require and fitting them into the channels. And it's very much a labour of love, but that's going to take us two years maybe to get through the 72 channels of that console. Um, but these things wear out. You know, 20 years, the, the, the metal's worn off the switch contacts, so new ones are required. Um, and that, that just keeps the console going and brings it back up to its, its proper spec. Vintage microphones are an interesting um, an interesting area. Um, the M50s um, back it, back in the day when I started back in the nineties, we didn't have M50s here at Air. We managed to source a set of them from somebody who'd reconditioned them uh, towards the end of the nineties, and they've been recording absolutely everything on the Decca tree ever since. Um, it's it's just the gold standard. Um, they those in particular were refurbished at the time really well by the guy who originally ran the Blue Microphone Company. I don't know if he's I don't believe he's still involved with them, but yeah, they were that's a very good set of uh, microphones there. Um, other microphones though, we've had the Neumann U67s, which are much loved, but here at Air, microphones get much used um, and. Um, Yes, they're not kept pristine in their boxes with everything lovely. They're out and about working day in, day out. Um, so with items like that, it, we were extremely pleased when Neumann decided that the U67 was something that they actually wanted to reissue and not as a new version, but as they termed it, turning on the production line. So being able to actually get hold of um, n- more actually new, as in new as they would have come off the factory production line, back in the 60s was an absolute godsend um, because you for us again it's it's about reliability um, there are many uh, um, many aspects of valve microphones um, or just old equipment that can prove unreliable we can't afford to have unreliability you've got the orchestra sitting there they might be costing you 150 pounds a minute to have those players sitting there they get paid whatever happens so if something's not working we're losing money, or rather somebody's going to come to us saying, well, the orchestra's cost us this, but something wasn't working, so what are you going to do about it? So reliability is absolutely key. Um, yeah, well, but we've, uh, we're have we waiting for the point that Neumann might decide to reissue, reissue the M50s in the same way. Whether they'll be able to do that or not, I don't know, but um, that would be... But they've done the M49s. That, again, is a, is, is a great thing, because they, as they say, they want to do it, they're matching the original specs. I think what makes any studio distinctive really is a sort of, it's a one word answer really, it's the atmosphere, you know, the, um, uh, the, the feel of a place inside the walls really. I mean, you can, um, uh, you know, you can sort of fill a building with acoustic treatment and speakers and consoles and microphones, but, but it doesn't necessarily have a personality. And, and obviously the personality comes from the personnel and generally speaking, the personnel are, you know, sort of follow a trend of characteristics that ultimately reflect the um, the person who set up the facility in the first place. So, you know, it tends to be somewhat in their image. And and I think Air, in particular, of all the studios I've ever worked in, actually, um, exemplifies that more than any other. Um, obviously, as we all know, it was conceived and set up by George Martin in the early 70s. And, um, and I think the whole, his vision for Air at the time was to sort of try to create a space which was creatively free for artists and not so shackled by sort of record company constraints and timeframes and delivery deadline and all the rest of it. So um, so that sense of sort of freedom 
resulted in something that hadn't really you couldn't really find in studios at the time and uh, uh, and I, like I say it's since then it's been reflected in the personnel the staff the, right from the cleaning staff through the security guys the you know the assistants there's a lot of continuity of um, of employment people often stay here for 20 30 years you know it's not uncommon and uh, and I think that's what you feel when you walk into the door you know there's a sort of longevity of of uh, of familiarity really you know so that's for me that's what characterizes it the the legacy is very strong and um, george wanted to make a facility to record film music and he succeeded by creating the the second well now unfortunately the the, the uh, one of only two facilities in london and we're still going strong doing that to record large orchestras most interesting sessions I did were with George Martin. He, w working with him was amazing because you got to see up, f up close and personal. His major uh, talent, I think, well, apart from being a great arranger, was he was great with people. Whoever you were, whether you were coming in with the tea, whether you were um, an arranger, or whether you were Cher or John Bon Jovi, he spoke to everyone the same. So if you were speaking to him, he's engaged in what you're saying, he's respectful, and he would always, you know, you felt like you were the most important person in the room. I th yeah, his, that was the major thing I learned from him. It was quite incredible watching him just, he could charm the birds from out of the trees. He really could. He's so personable. Even when things were going wrong, uh, he could just smooth things over with the artist and just the way he would kind of just a little smile, little chat. It was incredible. I think that's why the, I think that's why the Beatles gravitated towards him because he was, you know, they were a lot of fun. He wasn't rude to them. He was thought they were funny. He enjoyed them. He was, you know, he was a decent, he was good to them. So I think that's why they got on so well. Because he was a decent, proper, good like, human being, you know. Most staff have been here for a while. I've been here, as I said, for 15 years. Our bookings manager bit has been here for over 30 years. Glenn on security has been here for 25 years, nearly, you know. So there's a real sense that there's a family here that I think that people really care about what we're doing. You know, whenever you step through these doors, not only do we want to sort of give you a really professional result, but also that we give you the best possible experience of being in a recording studio and making the most of your music. So there's a lot of, yeah, love and kind of friendliness that I think really comes through here. Something, something I feel personally about Air Studios um, being one of what is now probably considered one of the... Uh, the old boys of this place, even though not the old boys of Air Studios full stop. Um, it still to me very much feels like George Martin's studio. Um, the, it, and, and that's actually quite special to actually feel that we're kind of looking after this whole place like for him and carry on his, what he wanted to do and, and his ethos in wanting to, with the original Air Studios, in wanting to have a studio where um, I think one of his... One of the phrases they came up with was technical excellence without hindering artistic expression, so something along those lines, um, which I think was a way of saying they wanted to kind of do what they wanted in the studio and, and muck about and do things that perhaps the technicians at the previous studio um, that we all know and love hadn't allowed them to do. It was giving give the freedom to operate how he wanted to, um, but to do it really well and to do it at the best level that you could possibly provide um, and and continuing that and feeling that there's yeah to, to be to be able to say that back in the day yeah George George was my boss that was actually still like yeah that kind of keeps me going and keeps me wanting to make sure it is the best that we can make it that's all for now if you like what you saw please be sure to like and share it and subscribe and click the bell icon so you know when we upload new content to our YouTube also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for watching.